Good morning. Welcome to Office of the Citizen. My name is Regina Asker, and it is a pleasure to be with you. I am based in New York practicing as a family nurse practitioner. Today, I have the honor to have with me in the studio a very distinguished guest in the person of Chief Dr. Dele Mamadou. You all know Dr. Dele Mamadou as the chairman and CEO of Ovation International Magazine. We know the critical role the media plays in building the mindsets of a community and providing information and a platform to be seen and to be heard. So this morning, Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the studio a distinguished personality in the person of Dr. Dele Momodu. Dr. Momodu, you're welcome to Office of the Citizen. Uh, good evening from Lagos, Nigeria, and good morning to our friends in the United States. How are you today, Regina? I am good. I'm good. And I'm very honored to have you in the studio. I've been waiting a long time to do this. Thank you for honoring our invitation, Dr. Momodu. You are the boss. And I, I, <laughs> you, you. Are, you are an icon, and uh, we must all respect you. So thank you for inviting me on your platform. Thank you. All right. So um, without beating about the bush, let us go into the story of Ovation. Ovation is a classical, renowned magazine in Nigeria, in Africa, in, uh, in Europe, and in some parts of America. And... Um, we knew when you started out on Ovation, you have nurtured it through, um, you know, the turbulent waters uh, in the business environment in Nigeria, and you have grown it into a magazine of international renown. Please tell us the story of Ovation, because it's not just Ovation now, there's Ovation TV also. Congratulations on that. Let us hear how you started with Ovation and nurtured it. Uh, well, uh, Ovation is a child of circumstance. Ovation came at a time I least expected. I planned to publish a magazine called Ovation as, back, as far back as 1992, 91, 92, after I quit my job as the editor mm -hmm. of Classic Magazine. Uh, okay. I wanted to do publication. I had a business plan. Everything was going well, but I couldn't raised the funds at the time. I had two prominent Nigerians in mind. I approached both of them, and both uh, liked the idea. I already had the title ovation ready, uh, but unfortunately, things didn't quite work out. Then I decided to go into public relations work, and I was doing relatively well. I also became the founding editor of what is today known as This Day Newspaper in 1992. Wow. So I paid the thought of ever doing ovation again. But as they say, a man proposes, God disposes. Yes. In 93, Chief Abdullah went into politics and I followed him as a media campaigner, uh, which led me into a series of trouble and turbulence. <laughs> I was put away in detention by the Babangida government in 1993, July to August. Okay. Then Chief Abiola himself was arrested in 1994 and uh, kept in complete uh, solitude. Mm -hmm. And then in 1995, July 22nd, to be precise, uh, word came to me, first to my wife, that I should disappear because the Abacha government was going to arrest me. Oh, and yeah. from that moment till today, I never went back to my house. But I met my wife on the way to the house, and she told me I was on the watch list, and I needed to disappear. So I had to go into a bunker like Saddam Hussein. You know, in Iraq. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This and is then, real. Mm -hmm. I never planned to live outside Nigeria in my life. Uh, if it was Babangida, maybe I would have waited. But with Abacha, anything could have happened. Yes. I appeared from the surface of the earth, I could have been killed, anything would have happened anyway. Mm -hmm. So I plot my exit very meticulously. So from that 22nd July 1995 to 25th July, I was planning with my friends, uh, with my co-conspirators, if I can put it that way, 
I managed to escape from Nigeria on 25th, the early morning of 25th July. I crossed from somewhere close to Seneboda into Kotonou in the Republic of Benin. Uh, and then from Kotonou, I moved to Togo, from Togo to Ghana. So I got to Ghana late evening uh, of the 25th of July, 1995. Then I spent three nights in Ghana, so I, I now have to plot my next escape to England, where my friends and other Nadeko chieftains were waiting for me. Uh -huh. So I spent three nights in Ghana. That was my first time in Ghana. Uh -huh. And I left in the evening of 28th, July, 1995, and I arrived at Gatwick Airport on the 29th. And thus became my exile for the next three years. I couldn't come back to Nigeria. I couldn't come near Nigeria. Um, and then, so I became a refugee in England. And uh, the next thing now was, what will I be doing for a living while staying in England? Uh, it took the intervention of a young cousin of mine, Shegu Fatoye, who one day yeah. challenged me and said, ah, hey, what are you doing in London now that you are not able to go back to Nigeria? I said, oh, I didn't know. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm hoping that but, yeah, something will happen and we'll be able to go back. I didn't want to stay outside Nigeria. That's why the fact that I had multiple visas to a couple of countries, you know, but mm -hmm. I preferred, and I still prefer to live in Nigeria, you know. So, yeah. to cut it pretty short, it was the one who prompted me into doing something along the media. That, oh, you were a good journalist back home, so why don't you mm -hmm. add something? But then, the problem again of funding arose. I am able to get money. Uh, we did our business plan, and the business plan showed clearly that we needed about 150,000 pounds to mm -hmm. start scale. If you sold my family from first generation to last generation, there was no way I could come up with 150,000 pounds. <laughs> so, but we were very, very determined yes. to go ahead. Mm -hmm. So I went, I approached my bank manager at the National Westminster Bank in London, who said, oh, she knows that I'm a very, very passionate young man, oh. but I didn't have a history or a credit history, you know, oh. a history of doing business in the United Kingdom. As such, it would be impossible for them to grant me a loan, but you could see the fire yes. on my face. So she decided she was going to advance me at least 5,000 pounds overdraft, oh. uh, which, of course, amounted to a drop in the ocean. Then my uncle, Chief Ezekiel Fatouye, who had retired from Nitel, in our family, we don't have rich people. We only have scholars, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it had to scrape his uh, uh, savings mm -hmm. for him to send the first 10,000 pounds. And then I also sold a few things there. And then, then a few young friends of mine also gathered 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds, you know, uh, to support me. And I was going to have a partner. Uh, unfortunately, just before we started the business, he pulled out because he said, my ideas were too fantastic. Uh, Adele, you are too flamboyant. I don't think the problem we had about this. And here I was, I said we should go and invest 14000 out of it on, a, on getting a very beautiful office in mm -hmm. a very posh neighborhood of Docklands. You know, he, he felt, hey, if you spend 14000 then you have 6000 so how are you going to print that? But, you see, what I realized from working with some very, very big personalities was that no rich man does business with a poor man. Yes. Image everything in business. Still today, yes. that's the secret of ovation. Yes. Your, the way you perceive you, the way your clients. So I was targeting the A list. Yes. Yeah. So I needed to prove to them that I had the capacity, the capacity and the capability to deliver. Yes. The type of magazine, the quality the class of magazine, the category of magazine that we wanted to do. And I would like to stress that every media organization must have a niche for itself. Yes. And the niche chose for vision was lifestyle and entertainment. Yes. So we were going to report the lifestyles of the rich and famous and not so famous African uh -huh. achievers, we're not going to publish sad stories. 
there are already enough magazines doing that. We're not going yeah. to be attacking people. There are already, already more than enough newspapers and magazines doing that. So mm -hmm. our next to exciting stories yes. and allow leaders the freedom to judge what the story is all about. So mm -hmm. a lot of people today still don't understand that niche, but I'm using this platform and this opportunity to let people know that from day one, yes. our mission was a celebration of Africa. Yes. So we're in the business of judging people, we're not in the business of policing people, we're not in the business of destroying people. We wanted to just report exciting news about newsmakers and then let the readers decide whether they want to read it. If you don't like that type of magazine, there are other magazines. You can have a magazine. Fantastic. For, yes, Fantastic. Uh, Fantastic. And you know, when we look at ovation, we are so proud to be Africans because the story presented about Africa out here is like, you know, not not um, flattering at all. You know, sometimes you're ashamed when you see some of the stories presented in the media out here. So when you whip out ovation and say, see my people, oh my goodness, you feel very proud, you know to be Nigerian and to be African. And I'm very happy that uh, you were able to stick by your dream despite all those uh, problems you went through, which in itself catalogs all the problems that young Nigerians go through in, in their efforts or in their, in their you know, attempts to establish businesses like that. And I hope they listen and I hope they learn that no matter the obstacles, your passion and your drive will um, push you forward. But then it's not just um, Ovation also. You have um, migrated to Ovation Television. What led to that? Are you still going to be reporting flamboyant? So are you going to, um, what is the niche of Ovation Television? Well, before Ovation Television, we also established an online newspaper called The Boss. Maybe you are not familiar with that. The Boss is a very, very clean, very serious newspaper that comes out every Saturday online. Mm -hmm. I will send you the best version today. Okay. I'll send after the... And the idea is that those we are not able to accommodate in Ovation Magazine because of its niche, and I will continue to emphasize the word niche. People need to understand that there are magazines created for different reasons, different purposes. Ovation is strictly an event, a lifestyle where you see the best weddings, the biggest homes in Africa, the best birthday parties, the best funeral celebrations and all that. While the boss is a newspaper that goes after news behind the news. For example, when I interviewed the former minister of petroleum, uh, Diziani Alizi Madweke, we published yes. it in the boss. Because that okay. type of news is not for Ovation magazine. So what we have okay. done is to create okay, a divergence of publications where you have one that targets news while the other targets entertainment and lifestyle. Great. Now, Ovation International, we've been at it now for over seven years. We've been working slowly but steadily. I like to work slowly because I, I find it difficult to go and dive into a loan. In mm -hmm. Africa, the interest rate will kill you. So what I try to do is to build from bottom up. Yes. I always build from bottom up. So we Solid started... Foundation. The original idea came from a good friend of mine, a brother of mine, uh, Senator Ben Murray Bruce. We met on a flight from Abuja one day, and he said, Dele, come, 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 come to think of it. Why don't you have an ovation television? And I said, I never thought of it. He said, that would be a bomb. He said, what you're already doing in the magazine, you can translate into audiovisual. And I was like, oh, yeah. wow, that's true. That's possible. So what I then did was, that any time I traveled, instead of wasting money on buying clothes and shoes and bags or whatever, I will invest a chunky part of it on buying cameras, buying tripods, buying gadgets. And yeah. people didn't know that I was already stockpiling slowly but surely. I was stockpiling my gadgets. And then one day I was in Ghana. A gentleman, a boy, came to me. He, he had a franchise for Sun City, Ghana. And I told him, I said, ah, you know, I have this dream about doing 
and Vision Television, and say, oh, he would like to be involved. And that was how the whole thing started again, like a joke. And then we did a logo. It took us over three, six months to do that logo because I am a perfectionist. I believe so much that quality would always sell a good product. So we took mm -hmm. our time. By the time we started syndicating it on different platforms, we were on Silverbird Television, we were on AIT, we were on Galaxy, on MITV. And then, yeah. as fate would have it, Instagram TV came. Yes. So TV started aligning us so you can upload up to 10 minutes. So yes. an average content, normally, if you go and cover a wedding, so we had it to 10 minutes, and then you put it on Instagram TV, free of charge, and it's global. Yes. My followership, I have about 621,000 followers. So it will be a million, yes. Yeah, so I have 1.3 million followers on Twitter. And then I had huge followership also on Facebook. So by the time you combine all these platforms, you are bigger than any newspaper, any local newspaper. You are yeah. almost bigger than television stations. So that was how we've run for the past five years. Then boom, yeah. recently, a new platform emerged in Nigeria called Our TV. Our yeah. TV is based on Abuja, uh, which is just like a DSTV, but they use a decoder and a dish. Yes. And it's a one-off. Once you buy a total package plus installation, I'm sure I don't more than mm -hmm. 25,000. Mm -hmm. Then you are watching a Miliki, you know, channel. We say no dull moments, you know. That, that's our line. Yeah. Our payoff for the Ovation TV, no dull moment. You can wake up in the middle of the night, you are bored. You know if you go to Ovation TV, There's you are going to see there. Not just from Nigeria, and because we're a global brand, so we get content in fashion, in music, you know, best interviews, all on the Ovation International Television platform. Fantastic. So Fantastic. <laughs> so now you are going to be hot cake. Every politician, every big man, every person that has a dream that needs a platform to be seen and heard is going to reach out to you. Now, this is a great thing you have in your pocket. And I'm happy it is you because of your personality being able to reach reach out to a great variety of people from the top to the bottom. And this brings me to something I have noticed in you. There's a trait in you, you never get angry. You never get angry. I have watched you interview people. Who, you know, when I see that, I say to myself, oh my goodness, after all he said about him, he's talking to this guy, you know, you never get angry. Now, I want you to comment on why it is important to be able to, you know, be able to rein in your emotions, especially when you are in public office or when you are a politician. Because what we see these days is next to an embarrassment. Uh, who do you think you are? You know, do you know who I am? Or I am a Lagos boy, you are a village boy. What is all that? Can you talk to us about decorum in, you know, the necessity of decorum in public of officials? Yeah. Character. Uh -huh. it's about your background it's a reflection of who you are where you're coming from mm -hmm. you know your experience growing up you know a lot of people experience so much bitterness while growing up <laughs> and it never leaves them it, it's yeah. a psychological i was very fortunate that as a young man i started working early with some of the biggest nigerians i'll give you a, a few examples someone mm -hmm. like about what they would the second day uh, the immediate past on your fifa, you know. I turned, I started working for him in 1986. I was only 26. I was every time I went to the palace to see my he was the closest to the Aula was mm -hmm. chief of Buffer. In fact, Chief Mrs. Hannah Igowudi Dulu Aula was the Yoba, like the mother of the king, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you will not believe it, and in the same palace. You will see pictures of Alaji Shehu Shagari, the, the then president, yes. who was really opposed to the Awulawas. You will see pictures of the Akinjides, the Akinoyes, who were in the opposing camps. Mm -hmm. So I from him that at the top, they can argue in public, mm -hmm. but they all meet in private. Wow. Meet. Only a foolish man who died for a politician of a big man. So a lot of people at time Babangi put you in detention. You still talk to him. You talk to his family. Oh, Abacha 
chased you out of Nigeria. Abacha killed people and you still mm. covered their wedding. That's my job. My job to report. Even if you kill my mother, I must still report it in my newspaper. Am I going mm -hmm. to say because somebody killed my mother, then the news will not come out? Then nobody will buy my paper tomorrow. Then they will buy all other people's paper. Nobody's going to buy my own. You yeah. know, as long as I'm not judged, the secret of our success at Ovation is that we're not judgmental. I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. As I said, I don't work for years. So if you tell me somebody stole money, I will interview the person. But they say you stole money. And the answer you give me is what I will publish. Whereas yeah. some people will interview the same person and abuse the person. Uh -huh. by the person. That's not my job. My job is to report, ask questions, mm -hmm. and make sure I, you see, I use my access effectively for my readers. Mm -hmm. What readers are buying, a lot of people don't know. It's not just the quality of ovation, but the content of ovation. The yes. fact that, if you talk about Chief Fernandez, Dele will talk to him. If you talk about Chief Ariak, Dele will talk to him. You talk about Meka uh, Ojuku, Bianca Ono, they will allow me into their wedding. They will not allow other people to penetrate into You know, I mm -hmm. go to the inner recesses. Yes. That most journalists cannot penetrate. That is the secret weapon that we use at Ovation. But you can't do that if people don't trust you, if you don't have integrity, if you don't have reliability. You understand? So I have access to particularly left, right, and center. And that is the beauty of journalism. And in terms of not getting angry, I get angry every now and then. I'm a human being. But mm -hmm. I try to train and restrict myself from okay. getting angry in public. The worst I can do, I, if you see me on social media, you see the way I respond, even okay. when these young people who say that Dele is uh, my boy, Dele is my deed, and all kinds of nonsense. But I know that when you are a public figure, if you don't want to get wet, go, don't go near the river. <laughs> okay. Chikola in particular taught me that. But Chikola used to tell that if people don't attack you, you are not yet important. Yeah. If people don't abuse you, then you are not doing something great. That it is the right foot that people throw stones at. If you are not right, nobody is going to... So the moment people start attacking you, then you will realize that you are getting closer to your destination, to the promised yeah. land. And that's what I do. So I know that now I must accept everything they throw at me. I've yeah. developed the skin of porcupine, so my, I have a thick skin. So mm -hmm. you can throw your arrows, but you will just see me getting better and bigger. So while you are busy getting angry in your homes and you, you, you are you are somersaulting because <laughs> they are making progress, I don't even know of your existence. I don't even know you. A lot of the people who ask me, I don't know them. They don't know me. Mm -hmm. And when they meet me, they apologize. Oh, we didn't know you are like this. I said, oh, but you know me. Before you can see through me, that I'm a genuine man too legit to quit. I yes. Don't do people don't know. I don't comment business. They mm -hmm. don't know. Ovation has less than ten percent government people. They say we promote we promote thieves and rogues. No, go and look at the institutions that I've met. Many African presidents. I've met mm -hmm. American presidents. I've met Her Majesty the Queen. Mm -hmm. If I was doing this magazine, that would not be possible. So, but you people out of envy. They just assume. A lot of people don't even read. Mm -hmm. they, they have never seen Ovation. All they see is that Ovation had a wedding on the cover. And they ask that, oh, why should Ovation carry it? Or, oh, Ovation must have made a billion out of this buffet. It's a business. It's not a charity. Mm -hmm. That's another thing people don't know. Yes. That's why media fail in Nigeria. Because they don't treat the organization as a business. It's a business. So how come... The person you call a rogue can go to the market and the market woman will sell her goods to mm -hmm. him. The yes. person will go to a farm and they will still sell paracetamol to him. The same person yes. to do a wedding and all the pastors will come there. They will bring MC. Alibaba will come and MC. Uh -huh. bring the band and King Sonia to come and sing. They will all sing. And when they finish, they will come and grab the photographer. Then they will do. Why did you take the pictures? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. This is really, really, you know, talk full of words of wisdom. All right. Okay. So um, let's cut to chase. Let's talk about Nigeria. Okay. Um, 
those of us who encouraged um, the voting of President Buhari into office, right? We did so, okay, on, a, on the premise that he was a tried and tested general, that he would come in and put his foot down and ensure the security to life and property. In your own view, do you think he has been able to achieve this singular purpose that most Nigerians, um, on which most Nigerians voted him into office? And if not, what do you think? What do you advise? Please make a few comments on that issue. Um, pass or fail? on this yeah. situation of security in Nigeria? Let me make a quick clarification. I didn't yeah. support Buhari because I didn't get anything spectacular from him. Mm -hmm. I supported him once because a lot of Nigerians said they wanted a saint and they believed Buhari was a saint. <laughs> if we had not tried Buhari, we would know about his capacity, okay? Mm -hmm. And capability. Mm -hmm. So they wanted a saint. I kept telling them that what you need in a, in a country is not a saint, but a performer. Yeah. There is no country government No, not even the Vatican. The Pope mm -hmm. is not a saint. You will only become a saint after... Afterwards. After, afterwards, okay? Mm -hmm. So, that's number one. Number two was that the mood of the nation, PDP are being possessed. And so it's natural. Even husband and you begin to get bored with each other. So Nigerians mm -hmm. were already bored with PDP. So we wanted to try, and there was a government that promised them change. Me, from the record and, and antecedents of Buhari, I knew he was draconian in his first outing, 1984-85. Mm -hmm. I knew that Buhari is very stubborn. They have accused, they had accused him of uh, Islamic fundamentalism and all that. Mm -hmm. I am not sure he had changed totally. But since the preponderance of opinion was that that was the type of person they needed in Nigeria, someone who can whip us into line, someone who can discipline Nigeria. And that Nigeria was too corrupt. Nigerians were too indisciplined. So they needed a man like that. Because I remember in 2011, I contested against Wari and Jonathan and others in 2011. And on one occasion, he had to send, I used to criticize him regularly, and he sent. Uh, Senator Larry Ted Yushu, he told him I was in Abuja, and the, 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 uh, the general said, Oh, to meet with me. Went to his house that night. I wasn't afraid, and he asked me pointedly, What do I have against him? I said, Nothing. Other than that, at, at age is no longer two. You were a contemporary of Margaret Thatcher. No matter what happens, Margaret Thatcher can never come back. You know, and he said, Oh, no, he still has something to, to contribute. To Nigeria and all that. And I said, yes, if I become president, I know you are interested in anti corruption. I will be very willing to empower you and even make EFCC a bigger, you know, uh, organization. And then mm -hmm. so you can be in charge of anti corruption. I know you will do that very well. But the weight of Nigeria on the 70 something year old man will be too heavy for you to carry. Anyway, we, you know, interacted and I left him. Of course, he lost the election. I also lost the election. So by 2014, when my friend, uh, the governor of River State, Rotimi Amechi and others started, so I got involved. I believed in them. And then my own reasoning again was when they brought in Professor Yemi Oshibayu as vice president, I was very confident that whatever Buhari did not know, they would allow someone the like Oshibayu. No. Yes. Guys who are in that government, we had the Nazi Royal Rufais, we had the uh Babatu de Raji Fashalas, you know, they were all in, in, in that government, you know. So I assumed that it will give them the free hand. The first thing for the first six months or so, the man could not even make up his mind about his cabinet. So I, I got worried and I fired in a memo, it was a very hot memo. In fact, the memo was so hot, and because of the support I gave him, because me, when I support you, I support you totally. They yeah. quickly said to me, I was in, I was in uh, Accra. Mm -hmm. When the presidency sent for me, that I should please come, that the president wanted to see me. And I went there, and I went inside his office, alone, me and him, and God. No other soul was with us in that meeting. And I told him my mind. I told him all the things I wrote about Jonathan. I said I had appointed myself as 
a special advisor to Jonathan, writing memos to him almost on a weekly basis, free of charge. And I brought a compilation of everything I wrote about Jonathan. And I gave it to President Buhari. And he thanked me, even requested for my autograph. He said, I should sign. I signed. Then we called in the cameras and we took loads of, if you go on, on the Google, you will see loads of pictures with him. We got on very well. And I was very excited. I was not interested in the government. I was not a member of their party. Because again, people tend to blackmail us. Oh, you people were expecting ministerial appointment. They didn't give you. That's why you started. No. My own was to get a good government. I know that if we have a level playing field in Nigeria, I will thrive. Nigerians are naturally yeah. good. We are very yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So yes. if that was good, who would be looking for government? The reason a lot of people who want to go into government is because there is nothing else happening for them outside. I am more than engaged and more than fulfilled uh -huh. in, in my line of business that I don't need government. I don't need to beg government for appointment. Yes. So appointment should be for service to the people. But most people jump up. People even do. They do parties when they are appointed because, hey, my time has come to partake in the national cake. Yes. So Which is such a shame. Month after month, we started drifting and we started speeding towards disaster, disaster upon disaster. One thing that makes me very sad today is the fact that even if Buhari could not throw if he could give us electricity, if he could not give us water, I expected him to give us security. Security. If on that yes. security, if yes. I expect but what I see today is like a non-challenge. Non-challenge. If people say, oh, the people who are handling the architecture and all it doesn't them, it doesn't care. Oh, you know, Sashi. We can live with this while we complain. Let me, let me ask you, sir. Let me ask you. He has a retinue of security chiefs. He has a retinue of people he has appointed into offices. Why are these people not picking up the slack? What is happening to the vice president? Why is the vice president kind of silent? He's not saying anything. He's just like caged. Uh, like I, somebody preventing him yeah, from talking. What about the service chiefs? People are Nigeria. migrating from outside Nigeria, getting in there and slaughtering people, and everybody's just looking the other way. What is going on? Let me tell you, there's nothing the vice president can do. The vice president was appointed by the president. It's the sole prerogative of the president to appoint vice president and yes. roles to him. So if the president does not assign roles to you, all you can do as a lawyer member of government is to do whatever they assign to you. He's working. It's just that the work he's doing is such that does not make him visible. And I don't think it's just about the president. There are also, don't forget that the president also has his own inner caucus. So what I think, my own reasoning, and this is strictly yeah. my own uh, reasoning, is that there are people who feel saved by the status and stature of the vice president. Extremely brilliant man, a professor of law in a, in a, in a country littered with illiterate politicians. So an illiterate would always suffer an inferiority complex for yes. such a high-profile professor. It is natural. It is normal. Okay? Two, they are suspecting that maybe it might be nothing presidential ambition in the What future. is wrong with that? Yes. So, yeah, oh, the those who control Nigeria, there are no more than 10 people. I can talk to you about that. Ask me later. Mm -hmm. There are people, the owners of Nigeria in quotes, there are those we call the owners of Nigeria. They control who goes, who comes in. And I can tell you, as we're speaking now, they have their first team, they have their second team, they have their third team. The way Nigeria is configured is that they permutate on a regular basis. These 10 people that I'm talking about, and most of them come from the military background. The military is, is still controlling Nigeria. Forget about this civilian thing. That is why you see that soldiers are roaming the streets in 
any civilized society. Mm -hmm. You don't see soldiers roaming the streets. You don't see soldiers guarding anybody. You don't see soldiers, you know, being drafted to uh, places where there are riots. Mm -hmm. That is why we had the anti riot police. I'm sure you remember. We have the what we used to call the kill and go. We had the anti riot police. <laughs> yes. Okay? And now they've jettisoned our police. They now use army. Some people even use DSL. DSL is supposed to be a secret service. Can okay. you imagine? Who go and get a secret service man to be guarding a civilian in America where you live? It, 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 it doesn't make sense, but that's the, the way we have so bastardized and banalized our security architecture in Nigeria. So, those who should be concentrating on spying, okay, on all those bandits to tell us their movements so that the security people can go and wait for them, can relay them, and finish them up. They are the ones now guarding private individuals in Nigeria. Oh, Lord. So, and once Buhari fails in the area of security, yes. then he has failed for it because the Yorubas have a saying, I don't know how good your Yoruba is, we cannot give you the title of a vulture or a hawk, and then you cannot catch ordinary chicken. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you Apt. Yes. So cannot be a, general, a respected one at that. Mm -hmm. And you had been in power before. God gave you a second chance. Yes. And the second chance today, the article I wrote today in this day and the boss yes. newspaper, you will see how I marshaled my argument that mm -hmm. if Wari will not do anything for legacy, it should at least unite Nigeria. It will yes. make 10 minutes. And all ten will be northerners, and nothing will happen. You all shout. You all, it will be, tomorrow. You will make another one, and it will still repeat the same thing. You can't run a country like that. that so you cannot. As yes. the one who supported him in 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. I am appealing to him that, for his own sake and for the sake of his family, yes, he should do the. He should bring Nigeria together. If Nigeria collapses on his head. History will not be fair to him. It will and that will be unfortunate. Good of history. He yeah. is not a very bad man. A lot of people might not agree with me. I think I with me. I don't know what, when you meet Buari, the Buari that you meet is different from the mm -hmm. Buari that you see in the news. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I don't okay. know. There's something in power that makes mm -hmm. people to misbehave or mm -hmm. that makes people to, to go blind to his because mm -hmm. is like there is something somewhere there is something yeah. wrong somewhere okay Why it's so have a yeah show it okay so um people do not go into power alone like you said there's the inner caucus of 10 I don't know how we can reach out to this inner caucus of 10, to these 10 people that own Nigeria. And there I was thinking I was Nigerian and I had a, a say, only to find out that there's 10 people who are in control of what happens to me and my family in Nigeria. Anyway, how, is there a way to reach out to these 10? Don't they see what is happening? Don't they know what is going on? If the president is kind of incapacitated and the vice president is caged and not allowed to do the right thing, do these 10 people, they're not aliens. They are not from outside the, the world. They are humans. They have blood in their veins. Can they not see what is going on? What will Nigerians do right now at the failure of government to protect life and property? What do Nigerians do? Because they are not allowed to own guns to arm themselves. They are not allowed, you know, the security agents they report to, they don't support them. Every uh, other police guy is out there guarding somebody else. What's the ordinary Nigerian to do to stay alive in that country right now? You see, before I answer your question, you also have to realize that there are three critical issues affecting mm -hmm. Nigeria. Yes. The first is ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Ethnicity, tribalism. The problem right now is ethnicity. Yeah. Tribalism. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you have a leader who does not be totally an 
You're freezing up, sir. Um, something with your network. You are going to have this. No, I can't hear you clearly. I don't know why. I'm oh, okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, go okay. ahead, please. So, mm -hmm. The solution is to have mm -hmm. a leader who believes totally in Nigeria. A leader who has Nigerian blood flowing through his veins. Not a leader who is thinking, I am Yoruba, I am Ausa, I am Igbo. It must be a Nigerian who sees and we found one and we wasted him in Abiola. Oh. Abiola believed absolutely in Nigeria. I worked with him so I know for a fact that he worked assiduously to have one Nigeria. We had one in General Agawan. That's why they use this acronym, Go, Go on, on with one, one Nigeria. Yeah, you understand? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. so the biggest problem we have right now is that rather than have a global statesman, a national figure who aspires to be a statesman, we have a man who, who is okay and content with being a local champion. Oh, yes, I'm the champion of the Fulani cause. Oh, nobody is going to make my, uh, my people suffer in Nigeria. I am going to protect my people. The best way to protect your people is to give love to others. If you want to pro protect your own children, mm -hmm. show other children. Yes, yes. Best protection. Let me tell you, when mm -hmm. we were growing up, I didn't know the difference. We have Sabo in Ilife. My father had a small uh, bar just across from Sabo. Nobody cared. Mm -hmm. We would go into Sabo to go and buy Akara. The Akara was so sweet. That nobody knew the difference between Ausa and Yoruba. My father came from Edo State and lived in Ilefe and worked in Ilefe and died in Ilefe and was buried in Ilefe. During the Civil War in my church, we had Baba Fine Face and Igboma, who was one of the pastors in my church, Baba Fine Face traveled home for the war. We kept everything he left behind was kept intact for him. Mm -hmm. One of his children was named Bamidele, just like me. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nambi Azikwe had a son called Dele. Mm -hmm. We didn't have all this division, but mm -hmm. the political military came and they used divide and rule to enslave us. So if Guari wants to protect the Fulanese, the best way to do it is not by treating others as slaves to Fulanese. I have Fulani friends. They are amongst the most beautiful. They are very educated among them. But mm -hmm. do not people, you say, because of their cows, then everybody must bow to cows. No. So <laughs> he, he just needs people who can advise him, look at him straight in the eye and say, mm -hmm. just don't do like this. Yes. Nobody hates the Fulani. In fact, you are causing more hatred for the Fulani mm -hmm. by enslaving others. Yes. When you get appointments in customs and excise, and all the top 10, or almost, are from a particular place, you make appointments in the security. You pick chief of uh, army staff. You pick chief of this. You pick chief of that. And 90 something percent of them are from a particular geographical mm -hmm. in Nigeria. You are, then you are going to create animosity. Yes. And yeah. that, 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 there is so much bitterness. Yeah. So the second religion. Okay. Religion is the second problem. Yeah. This is the first one. Religion is the second. Religion is so volatile. And that's why it is called the opium of the people, according mm -hmm. to Kapu. Because people are ready to die for religion. You have seen people commit suicide because they believe they are going to heaven somewhere where they are going to meet virgins and meet all kinds. So religion in Nigeria has become so sensitive. Mm -hmm. And people are killing, people are being killed in Benue, people are being killed in Plateau, people are being killed in Southern Kaduna, people are being killed all over the places. So the third one is the issue of money and yes. poverty. Yes. In a country where you have a combination of poverty and ignorance. Mm -hmm. So well, that is, life has become meaningless in our country. Yes. Every day, like, yeah. bandits have killed 200 people. It's no news. There is nowhere in the world. If you kill 200 dogs in New York, 
it will be on CNN for the next one week. Yes. That someone came and killed 100 dogs. Now imagine here, people, we hear people kill 200 people. She just die and they just go and give them burial. And that's it. So when yes. you have those three, ethnicity, religion, and issue of money, uh -huh. you are going to have a crisis, perpetual crisis. And that is what is happening in Nigeria. And Which these things are not, diff they are not uh -huh. difficult to tackle. Once you have a willing and ready leader who knows that, hey, let me bring everybody together, the day you are appointed president, you are no longer president of APC or PDP. You are father, everybody's president. Father of the nation. Yes, exactly. So, father of the nation. Sense of love. Yes. I, I disagree with Gwari now, but I don't have anything against him personally, but I disagree no. with him. Modus operandi. Yes. That is as far as I can go. But I will never wish him evil. I will never wish his family evil. But it's not everybody that is a daily model. It's not everybody that has my kind of mindset. Uh -huh. I believe that the best I can do is write, criticize, and profess solutions. And that's what I do on a weekly basis. And each and every one of us can do something to help. We can come together, do something in our own little way, whatever we are conversant with we, we can do something to help. Um, speaking of tribalism, okay, and appointing people um, to offices, to power, right, and leaving out a certain uh, group of people, do you think that the Igbos are still a part of Nigeria? Because if you look at the polity, if you look at the appointments, there are very few of them there. What, what will it take to integrate the Igbo man or the Igbo tribes into Nigeria? If you notice now, the conversation that, you know, is um, popular among the Igbos is Biafra. Why are they wanting Biafra? Because they feel disenfranchised. They feel not included. They feel, you know, left out of the, the, the meat of the polity. So how can we include the Igbos in the system or in the nation of Nigeria peacefully without Trust resorting me. to another civil Trust war? Trust me, my response will be very radical. The Igbos, I call them the Igbo. Mm -hmm. People, as far as I'm concerned, are the most integrated people in Nigeria. Forget really? about government. Mm -hmm. The reason we keep talking about government is mm -hmm. that people, that is where they share the national cake. The Igbos have moved beyond that. Okay. The Igbos, the Igbos have moved beyond sharing national cake. Mm -hmm. than the Igbos in Nigeria. Who does business more than the Igbos in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. Who ethnic group that you will find in every city, every village in Nigeria doing their business? Mm -hmm. If our the Igbos mm -hmm. are worried less about politics, let those who want to play politics play politics, and I will continue to control the jugular of the Nigeria economy. The Igbos control the economy of Nigeria today. But people are not conscious of it because what is visible is when you say you are a governor, you are a minister, you are a Senate president. Do you know how many Senate president the Igbos have produced in mm -hmm. Nigeria? Okay. Produced All right. But then, yes, in yes. Utopia. Yes. When, yes. So I am telling you that all these complaints just at the level of governance only. Yeah. And the Igbos don't need government to survive. In this Lagos, can anybody mm -hmm. today ignore the Igbo? If you ask all the Igbos in Lagos to go, I can bet my life that Lagos will almost collapse. Go to Ghana today. <laughs> all the over 100 shops closed down in Accra. I, I supported them, so I know. I have a list of all the shop owners. They were all Igbos. Mm -hmm. Wow. Go to Rwanda. If you look at anybody doing spare parts business, it's Igbo. Go to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Wherever you go on the surface of the earth, the Igbos are doing great things. Yes, they are. What mm -hmm. is the bonus? Which is government? Trust me. Today, I am happy that I'm not in government. I remember what people told me in 2015. Go and love me. Go to Adam uh, Shafo. Those grab his leg on the floor. Oh, no, no. Put my name forward. Madam, what I am doing today, if I am in government, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. The business I'm running today, mm -hmm. as tough and as as it is, I feel fulfilled. 
Yes. Yes. If I buy a car today. Nobody will say I buy. I bought it because I stole money from government. If I build mm -hmm. a house today, nobody, once you have contentment, you can ignore government. I'm not interested in government. If I okay. have to, to serve my country, then it is not worth it. So the yes. those who are complaining, they are talking about politics. Mm -hmm. The thing, but, the thing, the thing is that yes, if you are not on the table making policies that favor your people participating in laws because you understand where the shoe bites. So you need to have a place at the table to contribute to making those policies and uh, you know that will favor your people and will favor your businesses and will favor where you live. So if you can expect the Igbos to thrive and be contributing to building the nation, they definitely should have representation at the table. Taxation without representation is what led to the American Civil War. So we should, sorry, to the uh, American Independence War. So we should, if we, as we take from people, we should be able to uh, give them a place because it's been said, if you're not on the table, you're going to be on the menu. So it is important that we consider including everybody, making their appointments, like you said, I, also federal character. I, I, yes. And I Sir? have no knowledge about Nigeria. I was, I was once a presidential candidate in Nigeria, so I know my country fairly well. Yes. The yes. goals are well protected. The only thing we're about is number one or number two. I mean, mm -hmm. We all have equal representation in Nigeria. We have three senators in every state. We have for more members of the House of Representatives. There is no mm -hmm. state that is deprived of that. You have government people. There is nobody that is deprived of that. You have governors in Ibulan. They didn't bring Ausa to become governor of Anambra State. So if Anambra is not thriving, don't blame anybody. It's the fault of the government. Uh -huh. You are the people who came there and turned things around. You have other governors there now who are also doing their best in Ibulan. Yes. It's only number one and number two that the yes. And even that number one and number two, let's look at this. There are six uh -huh. geopolitical regions in Nigeria. Yeah. Okay? And the six at different times have produced either number one or number two. In the first mm -hmm. republic, you had Tafar Bale, okay, as prime minister, and you had Dr. Nnamdi Azikwe as president, okay? And when mm -hmm. the coup took place, the Inzeogu and all that, later you also had Agui mm -hmm. who was in power before he was killed, and then mm -hmm. you had General Gawan. And after Gawan, you then had, of course, the military people, uh, Mutala Mohammed, mm -hmm. and uh, then Obasanjo and Yaradua. But during the Second Republic, during the Second Republic, you had Chagari and you had Dr. Alex Ekweme of Blessed Memory. Mm -hmm. you, you, you had them. And thereafter, the Third Republic came, okay? And since then, you've had Enweren. You have you've had Okadibo as Senate president. You've mm -hmm. had um, what's the name of my friend? Pius Aim. You've had mm -hmm. Pius Aim. You have you've had Inamani mm -hmm. as Senate president. There is no time in the legislative life of Nigeria that mm -hmm. we have played prominent roles. So I will agree with you yeah. if you say because you have number one. On number two next. And don't forget that just by accident, by chance, you had a minority man as president of Nigeria in Dr. Uh, Goodluck Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when okay. you look at all that, yes, you will see that <laughs> okay. in, in reality, yes. in reality, we've all had our shots at the thing. And then politics is a game of number. Yes. If you play your game right, if there is an Igbo man today, and someone is mentioning Peter Obi, if there is an Igbo man today mm -hmm. who has the capacity to unite Nigeria, you have them. You must work with other Nigerians. Nobody will wake up and say, oh, I'm just going to give it to Igbo man. I'm going to give to Yoruba man. I'm going to give to yes. Igbo I'm going to give to Ikwara man. No. Yeah. It's consensus. So the person yeah. must have the ability to build that consensus and the easiest way for a southerner to become president in Nigeria today, because it is obvious that some parts of the north they are not ready mm -hmm. to hand over a southerner, is for the entire south, southwest, southeast, south-south, to work in sync 
with North Central. Okay. Then you isolate North East and North West. Mm -hmm. if you, for you to become president of Nigeria, you must control at least four zones out of six. Okay. That is the problem. All so right. For a man to become president of Nigeria, mm -hmm. he must lock down those four regions. If he's not able to, trust me, it will be wishful thinking. Okay. All right. So, um, 2023, Nigeria 2023, do you have a horse in that race? Are you going to con um, um, recontest for the presidency of Nigeria? No. 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 I'm not a serial contestant, so I'm not going to waste my time. Well, and, Buhari was, and he became president. And yes, that's Buhari. And that's because, let me tell you, to win election, for a good man to win election in Nigeria, you need the support mm -hmm. of bad people. Yes. Can you, can you hear that? To, yes. For a good man to win election in Nigeria, you need the support of bad people. And, and when, when bad people support you and you get into office, you can't do anything. Support you and you get into power. You can't do anything about them because yes. they are going to come back. It will be payback time. They are going to come back. Do you come mm -hmm. back to you and make requests of you. So that is what the situation is right now. Yes. Me, personally, I don't have the resources. I don't have the money. And I don't even belong to either of the top two parties. Okay. And I'm under the situation that I can win with a third force. I tell my friends, do not do all of them when they were contesting. Felado mm -hmm. to you, the Moga lose, you know, all of them. Show her. Mm -hmm. Yes, the show her, the Fashwas, all of them. Mm -hmm. I, your day, all the young folks, I told them, even if all of you combine, you'll be lucky to get one, one million votes in a country of 200 million people. That's the reality. I went through it. I went okay. through it. So I know what I'm talking about. It's a waste of time. Unless the godfathers decide... That enough enough. Again, they have one leg in PDP, they will have another leg in APC. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. Those who don't want power to return to the South, they are waiting. Okay. Once any party picks a Southerner as a candidate, they will wait and they will make sure they pick a Northerner to counter that force. And they will tell you the game of number and the game. They will first of all go and bring some atrocious votes from northwest and combine it with some even more atrocious you know votes from the northeast then they'll come and pick one of you in the south and they will they already have people keen up who want to be vice president in the south mm -hmm. and that's the end of the day. <laughs> so oh my god okay so I, let, let me let me talk about oh. yes let me take you to the yoruba nation okay let me take yes. you to the Yoruba Nation and uh, discuss the godfather of the politics of the Yoruba Nation, love him or hate him, he exudes serious power uh, in the politics of that side. Forget that some young, some hot-headed young people have, you know, been banding words to discredit him. But then again, uh, let's talk about the Jagaban. It looks like the Jagaban has been laying this card, you know, playing his cards for a long time by raising boys to men and appointing people to power, uh, you know, to offices where when he needs their support, they will be there to raise him up. The time has now come, it seems, for the ascension of the Jagaban. What do you have to say? Do you think he stands a chance, considering that his main legs in the person of Oshimole and also the whatever is going on in Edo State politics, those people who have really been his boys, they have been kind of... Um, truncated what are his chances in uh, making an impact in nigeria 2023 what do you say i have a way of answering questions and uh talking oh, yeah. specifically about the jagaban yeah the jagaban mm -hmm. the ashwaju who happens mm -hmm. to be my very very good brother, my good friend we were, mm -hmm. we were comrades at arms during the Nadeko era in England, that extremely brilliant man, very brave, very courageous man. Uh, he's been a kingmaker most of his uh -huh. life, and now he wants to be the king. My response is that it is, it is his right to aspire. Okay. So that is it. Let's get that. A lot of people say, oh, he shouldn't contest. I'm not one of those who will tell him not to contest. Uh -huh. My own position for as long as he can get the ticket of his party, 
Which a is anybody who the party APC, anybody who can get the, the ticket of APC of PDP stands a chance of becoming president of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Outside that, a lot of my young friends say, oh, it's rubbish. We can mobilize young people. Forget it. The, yes, the when are we going to move forward? It's like a recycling of people who have been I there since we were children. Yeah, it's a recycling, but if you do not know the death that killed your father, <laughs> okay, don't, <laughs> don't begin to say certain things. <laughs> It is from experience. I'm talking from experience. Okay. You there is a sword in front of you, and you are not the one holding you. And you're asking, oh, what death killed my father? It is possible <laughs> that that same sword will kill you in front of you, it will kill your father, and it will kill you. Uh -huh. So okay. now, Chief Bola Metinubu. Mm -hmm. is very lucky because he has history yes ahead. and that history is that at least he was not a young man when Chief Awolowo contested he was not a small boy when Chief Abiola contested so he has the benefit of knowing what happened that they did not get there so maybe he now has a secret weapon and secret formula that he will use to succeed where those two great men failed. You know what I'm saying? He needs that. He needs that key. He needs that knowledge. Sir, what went wrong? Anything we don't we, see, anything we cannot understand, anything that is secret now is subject to fallacy. That time has passed where people will claim to have the secret formula. Secret formula that you have not been able to put into use all this time, all these many years. Even through the boys talking, to raise to men. We're not talking about government now. We're okay. talking about of winning. Oh, you are, okay. If it's the chance of winning the election. And I'm telling you that elections are won based on strategy. That's true. And strategy is, you must have a repartition of knowledge about the past. Yes. You must have statistics yes. to know that, hey, if I am contesting from Lagos State, I will need someone from Northwest. Tinubu is a Muslim. I don't see how the North will allow him to pick a Christian. I was there when Chief Abiola wanted to pick a Christian and they refused. Mm -hmm. Chief Abiola had sent us out already to go and inform me, newspapers that he was speaking a Christian. And then the corner came and said, no, you cannot pick a Christian among us. Because we don't have how many yeah. except in the minority area, Taraba and a few places like that, mm -hmm. or Southern Kaduna, you cannot have a Christian who has that capacity to influence the North. So which means mm -hmm. Chief who would definitely have to pick another movie like Abiola. So that's why I'm saying what is the strategy? I'm giving you the nitty-gritty of the challenges ahead that yes. if Chief Tinubu stands up, he would have to pick a Muslim. So then he would now have to persuade Christians, both in the North and in the South, as mm -hmm. to why he could not pick one of them. That is very, very important. He would have to get fortunately for him, his wife is a redeemed evangelist. She'll be 60 on Monday. My very dear sister. Okay? Fantastic woman. She is a Christian. So whether the Christians will allow the wife to stand in proxy for him and say, okay, this man is a detribalized Nigerian, which he is. This man does not really care about religion if his wife is a Christian. So these are the primordial sentiments that Nigerians have to live with today. I don't know about tomorrow. Today. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the situation on ground right now. So, okay. In capacity for himself. Mm -hmm. You see, to be a president is not a base job. Mm -hmm. It's an epic journey. Wow. A president, oh. it means that you've already gone all these geopolitical regions 
and the majority uh -huh. of them have agreed to work with you. With Tinubu, that is not impossible because he has been in the game for a very long time. But even at that, it is not an easy job. But I'm sure it's probably, it's, it must be ready for him to... The, he hasn't declared anyway. We're, we're still in the area of conjectures. He has not told anybody. He was, I met with him about three months ago and he has not told anybody frontally. Yeah, you could, from body language, you could see that, hey, the time has come for him. Now he wants to do something. He believes he has the capacity. He believes he has the ability to get a, a good team that can change Nigeria for the better. Okay. That is change, Ni yeah. change Nigeria for the better, sir. Okay. Now, during the past elections, we all saw bullion vans driving up to his home, driving up to his quarters, bullion vans full of money in the midst of abject poverty, when Nigerians could not even, you know, afford to eat. No. And the bullion vans. Okay. So how about community uh, development? How about giving this money to, you know, build hospitals and clinics? How about doing something tangible? But we use bullion vans to pay young people, give people 1,000 naira, 2,000 naira, and release them to go and cause mayhem to get people. I don't know how they play politics back then. Maybe I'm not understanding what is really going on. But if he really had the, you know, at heart, if he really had the progress or betterment of Nigeria at heart, would he not be facing, you know, community development, human capital development, instead of all these politics of bullion vans and the and permutations and formulas of Christian and Muslim and all that, would he not be focusing on, you know, developing his fellow man? Please educate us on how these things work, because it breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart. I am not trained to speak about what I know nothing about. I saw the bullion yes. vans. Yeah. Picture, yes, anything could have been in the bullion vans. <laughs> anything. <laughs> like what? Like paper? <laughs> what? It could be anything. Seriously. Seriously. Yes, of course, the first thought will be money. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see them bring out the money. I didn't see them offload the money. If even if this money is not something I can comment about because I was not yeah. there. Yeah. Is it? I've told you that my brand of analysis mm -hmm. is not to write about what I cannot prove. Context I cannot out. prove one yeah. that the money came from government. I cannot prove because as a businessman, as an experienced man who has a lot of friends, I have a wealth of experience about friendship. I uh -huh. know that you can make money without stealing from government. I know that for a fact. And I can tell you how. Okay? I know uh -huh. how you can live like a billionaire without even having a million. Someone like... Tim Let's Hugo, talk later about that. <laughs> yeah. Me, I know that a man like Tinubu has enough and sufficient goodwill to make money. Uh -huh. He does not grab the vault. People say all sorts about him. And I will tell you why. I was with him in London from 1995 to 1998 till today. He still okay. lives in the same flat around Cavendish in Regent's Park. Till today, that same flat. He has not moved out of... I am telling you what I know, not mm -hmm. what them say. And whenever I go there, and I still went there in the last couple of years in London, he's there usually sometimes Baba Kondé is around. He's eating his fish and chips. If you know Tinubu, the bulk of the money, whatever money people say he makes or he gets, not for himself, he's giving it out to people. I have never seen a man like that. I am telling you. So when people talk about him, I have not seen anything in his personal lifestyle mm -hmm. that has changed so from the last 25 years that we were together in exile. The house, the, the body loan house, I don't know where he got it from, whether that was his retirement, because a lot of the governors, they have the retirement benefits and all. The same house I went about three or four months ago. I can't remember precisely where, but during not the lockdown, I went there and I was alone with him in that room. I was telling him that this room has not changed in the last maybe 10 or 15 years that I've been there. So if you know Tinubu very well, mm -hmm. you will know that he is not an ostentatious person. I'm just telling you now. So the bulk of that money goes 
to his supporters, to his friends, to the needy, to touches. MK Wabela was like that. Okay? Okay. And he has he has his food soldiers everywhere globally. Yes. So I'm not going to defend him or anything. I'm just responding to your question about the yes. bullion van. That a bullion van, I don't know what the bullion van was doing in his house, so I cannot comment about it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's been such an enlightening interview, and I'm so honored and happy that I was able to have this conversation with you. Uh, we do have some questions from uh, our audience that uh, I'm going to read out a few, and if you want to answer them, please feel free. Um, Oye Eze says, Nigeria is a highway to the grave where politicians cage and chain the 180 million citizens of the country inside the bottle. <laughs> and the only way to get to, out to freedom for all this problem is to break the bottle and cut the chain. Biafra is the only way. We talked about Biafra a, a few minutes ago, and you said that Igbos are everywhere. They hold the economic jugular of Nigeria, but we have to give um, thought to the fact that most of them, or too many Igbo people in Nigeria feel disenfranchised. If we do not listen to them, and, uh, and um, sort the problems that they're, they're presenting, we may have bigger problems in the future. Do you have anything to say to that? Why are people agitating for um, the Igbo so much, so much that they want Biafra? Um, before I, I go into I, another question. Nothing against Biafra. I have nothing against Yoruba nation. I have nothing against Arewa nation. As many nations as people want, as long as the people agree. Yeah. I was in Britain, yeah. I was part of great <laughs> the British people when mm -hmm. they vote. I have the right to vote in England. Uh -huh. yes. And I vote against living Europe. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so the Brexit, I was opposed to it. Uh -huh. But there were people, I knew so many Nigerians who supported it. So as long as there is a consensus. <laughs> A referendum that says the Igbos can go, and if they can go peacefully, people have asked me these questions. Do you think the Igbos can leave Nigeria peacefully? I don't see how it will happen because you can see that each time there is a Biafra uh, protest in uh -huh. Igbo land, they will send soldiers there. They will send so, which means the Igbos may have to prepare for another civil war if they want to quit Nigeria because those who want them by force may not agree. Otherwise, if it's just about voting, uh, go to National Assembly, we vote. The goals, we are going tomorrow. I don't think but there is the element of the use of force and that is where I think a lot of us are afraid that yes. whose children are going to get killed? Yes. Whose children are going to come to fight the war? Uh -huh. So, I don't have an answer to it and I will not comment on it. It's a yeah. The very simple... So, people agitating... There is nothing wrong with people agitating. Mm -hmm. Even when the Igbo nation comes tomorrow, some people will mm -hmm. still agitate within that Igbo nation. It's mm -hmm. not going to be an Eldorado. There are people who will say, we know our own Igbo. You have Igbo people in uh, Delta, don't you? In Delta yeah. State. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there are those who will say, I'm from Delta, I'm South-South, I'm not interested mm -hmm. in uh, Biafra. You, you know, it's much more complicated. When people say the yeah. Republic, I tell them that even... Between Ibadan or your Obama shop, Ilefe, Budakeke, we have problems. Between Ondo, Akure, Akoko, they have problems. So when people talk about Yoruba nation, they are talking as if there is that single nation. Mm -hmm. Yoruba if people are everywhere, also like Brazil. Yeah. Yoruba, mm -hmm. I have a first degree in Yoruba from the University of Ife. And I can tell you for free. That there are some Yorubas when they are speaking, I cannot understand what they are saying. Oh if I'm a person, I can't understand what they say. If an Ondo person is speaking, I can't understand. You understand? So it's yeah. not as simple. Even in Ijebu, in Ogo State, mm -hmm. you have the between Remo and Ijebu. Mm -hmm. You have a, you have a Badu, mm -hmm. you have Yewa, you have you know, you understand. So mm -hmm. it is not going to let's not allow a few people. Yes. To make us look stupid. Yes. I am telling you, there is power. China has demonstrated, India has demonstrated, mm -hmm. America has demonstrated that there is power mm -hmm. in unity. 
But if you talk to me about federating unit, oh yes. yes. Talk to me about the restructuring, oh yes. yes. Let each region yes. grow at its own pace. I know nobody can beat the Igbos. Maybe nobody that's can. the beginning of the solution. But so that for me, that's the solution. The solution yes. is not about I want my own nation. When you want your own nation, so are you going to bring the first president from Abia State, or you are going to bring from Imo, or you are going to bring from Igbo or from Anambra? Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Then yeah. you will start fighting. You will now see that there are other micro oscopy oh. things that you have to deal with. There are too many tiny issues in, in, in Nigeria. It's not going mm -hmm. to solve the problem. For me, the best way is let us restructure in a way that an Igbo man will not be stopped by a Kano man. Let every region yes. produce and manage its own resources. I agree. Okay, even yes. in America right now, you can see that California will not control New York. New York is yes. going to control Washington DC. Yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. that is what I think they were practicing the American style government. You mm -hmm. cannot have capitalism without capital. The problem with Nigeria today is that we are practicing capitalism without capital. People, when they get power, because they know that, hey, I don't know when next this thing will come to my area. So you will uh -huh. steal it as and steal in advance. Yes. The stealing. So the stealing is as if it's our right. Uh -huh. It's our to steal. So uh -huh. it is like corruption is competing. Do you understand? There is a competition in corruption. So you yeah. steal people. That's why they will say, yes, yeah, it's our turn. We are happy. Uh -huh. It okay. becomes possible for people to have access to easy money at the federal government. You will see that mm -hmm. a lot of people will not bother. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. The last question I'm going to take is, how much effort has have we made for restructuring? How can you use your platform, your media platform, to promote restructuring? What can we, as people in the diaspora, do to promote restructuring? And how can the ordinary Nigeria um, get involved in asking for uh, restructuring and demanding for these federating units to, you know, be considered. Um, how can we do that as we close out? Well, I don't think there is much the diaspora can do about restructuring. It is our people Talk at about home. It, agitate for it. No, well, you, we've all been agitating. Nothing is moving. We already have the biggest problem with that is mm -hmm. that we have lawmakers. Mm -hmm. who, when they get power, they don't want to step on toes. Mm -hmm. So they all align. All the laws are made by some people. So imagine if the Southern lawmakers can come together and fight okay, for their beliefs, fight for their principles, fight for their own ideology. Because Nigeria is a country without ideology. Mm -hmm. Nigeria is a country without philosophy. Yeah. So once you don't have that philosophical or ideological foundation, you will continue to have this kind. So right now, we live in an animal farm where all animals are, are equal. equal. But some, some are more equal than others. And nobody, all our leaders, nobody. People are talking about 2023. 2023 will come and go. A new president will emerge and the same nonsense. So what we have are seat warmers, not leaders. They are seat warmers. They just go to power. Let me spend my time. Ah, then it's my turn. No, don't come and scatter everything on my head. That is the attitude of our but the day you have a leader who does not need more than one time to change Nigeria. You will see that everything will change. I've had the benefit of living and interacting with leaders all over the world. And I know that it's not rocket science. Uh -huh. The problem we have is that we have selfish people uh -huh. who are not ready. They, they want to enjoy power as if after that they will carry the power home when they are leaving. You understand? Yes. And it's not true. It's not true. So okay. it, let's just hope that we can have men and women of conscience. Of conscience. Power, yes. Who will yes. realize uh -huh. Nigeria is nations on earth yes. that Nigerians are amongst the most intellectually 
find people in the world mm -hmm. and you see what will happen. Yes. Oh, thank you so very much, sir. Thank you for this interview. Um, I still have so many questions to ask you, but we're going way over the time. I can't believe we have talked for two hours. I will come back for you. And when I come back for you, I'm going to ask you about the media, you know, the position of the media in Nigeria today and all the laws that have been put in place. Is it to promote it or to muzzle it? How come when people are, you know, wanting to speak their minds, it, it becomes hate speech? They, they have legislated something to cage whoever you know dares to speak up against the evils in the society and how have you been able to navigate that type of law um i will talk with you subsequent in a subsequent interview about that because that's going to require another two hours and unfortunately we really don't have the time right now i'd like to say thank you very much dr Dele Momodu, and thank you for ovation and we all give you a standing ovation right now for sharing this knowledge with us and spending your afternoon with us thank you very much i look forward to meeting with you again all right thank you all right good night god bless and bye -bye. see you next time bye bye oh wow people i'm sure you all enjoyed that interview send in your questions because i'll forward them to him send in your ideas on nation building Sending your propositions on how we out here in the diaspora can, uh, you know, can um, put our efforts together to raise Nigeria up. The security situation, what can we do? If the government has failed, what can the people do to protect themselves? Okay, let's talk. Let's keep talking. Thank you for spending your time with me in the office of the citizen, the most important office in the land. Thank you for um, spending your time with me. I look forward to seeing you again next Saturday with another very exciting discussion. For now, it's goodbye. God bless. Take care of yourselves and of each other. Bye-bye. Oh my goodness.